Patrick. He's the world's most famous Irish man, but he wasn't even Irish. Yachida, lads. You may now offer each other a sign of peace. Peace? Peace, 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 peace. Nah, missed it. Yeah. Missed this. He celebrated for bringing Christianity to Ireland, but the Irish were already being converted by the time he arrived. Oh, oh, sorry. 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 He was a pious man whose terrible crime almost prevented his mission to Ireland. Something like this? <laughs> He's the one. <laughs> so I want to know how you go from mining sheep on a mountain somewhere to becoming the man that some people think is the savior of all of Western civilization. celebrate the feast of St. Patrick, a man most people know nothing about. People go, oh, he drove the snakes out of Ireland. No, he didn't. Those snakes left looking for work. <laughs> I'd say there's a cobra on Bondi Beach in a Wexford jersey who would take your hand off for a packet of potato. <laughs> snakes are exactly like Irish immigrants to Australia in that they love the sunshine and every so often all their skin peels off. <laughs> what plants is he associated with? Marijuana. <laughs> Marijuana. He drove all the snakes out of Ireland. He was a boss. Yeah. He always wore green. He was a boss. He helped um, the Irish people with the England, the like English people fighting against the um, English for independence. He was awesome. Who's awesome? Patrick. I didn't know he was real. He was very <laughs> Time to separate fact from fiction. The real historical Patrick is much more interesting than the man admit. But what do we actually know? Ah! We know Patrick was about 16, when at the beginning of the 5th century, he was kidnapped by Irish slave traders from his hometown, Banavem to Bernie. His father was a Roman civil servant. His grandfather was a priest. But Patrick wasn't religious at this point. He, in fact, was... He was taken aboard a craft, probably with many other Irish slaves, and then he was shipped off to Ireland, where he spent the next six years, at least, of his life. Uh, can we go back that way? No, seriously, no, 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 seriously, like, it's like, I'm not actually St. Patrick, you know that. Patrick wasn't holy as a boy. Now, I'd say he did exactly what we all did. You know, you said you went to church and then walked around town for an hour, then got home and played, who said mass, Russian roulette, with your man. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Who said mass? Oh, Father Dougal Maguire? You're wrong! I'd like to be an Irish teenage Catholic now. Uh, who said mass? The parish priest. How do you know? He's the only one left. <laughs> A lot of people have an image of St. Patrick. How close to the real historical figure is this image? It's close to the real Patrick, the sense that Patrick was a slave in Ireland, that he came back to Ireland to convert people. But a huge amount of it is based on a sort of a legendary take on Patrick, which was created for reasons of propaganda in about the 7th century. We're really lucky that the real Patrick left writings behind him, which tell us a great deal about his interior life, about his spirituality. And we can contrast it with the way he is portrayed in the later biographies by Muruku and Tira Khan. So the oldest of these writings that still exist are here in Trinity College? Yes, we've got the earliest copy of Patrick's uh, Confessio. It's in the Book of Armagh, which is a 9th century manuscript here. That copy of the Confessio is one which is edited down and removes some of the more controversial sequences of Patrick's own writings. The real Patrick is somebody who feels he's flawed, who admits to a sin he committed in his youth. So Patrick committed a great crime when he was 15 or 16, right? Ah, uh, no. What do you think the crime was? Uh, he burned something on a hill or something like that. Murder? Do you think? Two timing. <laughs> Two timing these girlfriends. Head <laughs> keep only Ireland would have a patron saint who committed a great crime as a teenager and still have the main juvenile detention centre in the state called St. Patrick's Institution <laughs> for Young Offenders. Brilliant. 
The real Patrick is somebody who's quite angst-ridden. Uh, he worries constantly uh, about his calling in Ireland. Uh, and he's somebody who freely admits that he has many flaws. On the other hand, the Patrick of legend is essentially like a, a superhero out of uh, comics or manga. Well, so much stuff is made up about St. Patrick that we're going to have a bit of fun now, OK? Your name is Jean, right? I want you to tell me if this is true or false according to the book of our man. His fingers, St. Patrick's fingers, glowed in the dark. <laughs> true or false? false? False. No, it's true. <laughs> they actually lost the horses one day in the dark and they couldn't find him, so he put up his hand and light emanated from his fingers, like some sort of Catholic Bishop E.T. <laughs> St. Patrick, phone roll. <laughs> In a time of great peril, his staff lit up so he could lead his followers away from danger. True or false? True. It's false. <laughs> that was Gandalf. <laughs> when Patrick was a boy, he was bitten by a radioactive spider. <laughs> which gave him all the powers of a spider. True or false? I think it's false. False! <laughs> that was St. Bridget. <laughs> For somebody like Muraku, a saint, was somebody who would be perfect, who would have lots of mir miracles, miraculous power from God. When he reads Patrick's writings, what he finds is somebody who has self-doubt. You know, there aren't miracles in Patrick's writings. For a 7th century writer who wants to say, here's Patrick, the apostle of the Irish, he doesn't really want the real figure. He wants somebody who will be very malleable, who will fit their propaganda. Guys, can we... Focus here. Can we just focus for a second? OK, look, all I'm hearing is Bridget this, it's Colm Kill that, OK? We need a bigger market share. Patrick needs to have banished something, OK? Monkeys. What has a monkey ever done to anybody? Look at it. It has to be something dangerous. Brother Michael. Brother Michael isn't dangerous. You don't have to share a dorm with him. OK, OK, look, guys, it has to be something truly terrifying that strikes fear into the hearts of men, eh? I've got it. So do I. Snakes. Women. Various churches were vying with each other, and in particular, Armagh and Kildare were two major rivals with their saints, Patrick and Bridget. So they're not simply writing about the saint as a saint. They're also using the saint as a vehicle to make claims about their own overlordship. Patrick is associated with Armagh, even though he doesn't mention Armagh once in any of his writings. What happened was later monks associated him, a famous person, with their place to enhance the reputation of the place. I was appalled by this until I remembered I was from County Offaly, home of Barack Obama, President of the United States of America. I'd like to get Patrick and Muraku in a room together to see what Patrick would say to Muraku going, Come from and Muraku going. Well, listen, I just had to kind of beef up the brand, to be honest with you. Ignore your many gods. There are a number of theories about where Patrick's hometown of Banavem Tabernae was. Some suggest that it was in Roman Britain, the area now known as Wales. Peace be with you. There's also a theory that Patrick was French. Peace be with you. Others suggest he was Scottish. But which theory is correct? So where was Patrick from? Uh, he was from somewhere in, in Western Britain, I suppose in modern terms we would say Wales. Many of us have an image in our heads of what Patrick looked like, but surely the real Patrick wasn't Green Santa, or in the Dubliners. So, Billy, you're telling me that this is what St. Patrick would have looked like? Well, Patrick the Slave, anyway, yeah. So no sort of big green bishop's garb, crozier, mitre? No, that's all later medieval bishops. This is much more practical and down to earth what a slave might have been wearing on the mountainside. Modelling the slave chic circa the 5th century. Is there any nice way of sitting down in this without flashing yourself to all and sundry? Knees together. Knees together like a Jane Austen there you go. like that. Right. Um, <laughs> can I ask you why we're in Mayo? Everything I learned in school in the tradition says we should be in a hill called Slemish in Antrim. Patrick only mentions one place name in all of the Confessio the woods at Voklot, which is near the Western Ocean. And that has been identified uh, as most likely being a place in County Mayo. And what sort of country is Ireland at this point? What sort of land is it? Um, it would have been 
rural, there would have been no cities. It would have been probably quite fragmented. Lots of smaller kingdoms, lots of uh, political intrigue and, and war. Quite a hostile place to be by modern standards. And would they all be wearing this, this beautiful garb? <laughs> well, like you're laughing at me, by the way. I'm freezing my nuts off here. <laughs> I can see why Patrick would go for celibacy, because you can't use them in this weather. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any um, evidence of what pagan rituals were like or what pagan life was like at this point? Well, we, we have the names of some of their gods and goddesses, we think, from, from later mythological tradition. Um, and we have bits and pieces of their rituals. We do have one account from the 10th century, uh, and it talks about how poets used to look for imbos forestni, which is uh, wisdom of illumination, or that they would look for poetic inspiration. And the way they used to do it was uh, they would get a piece of meat. OK. And it would be the meat of a dog or a cat or a pig. They're not very fussy, are they? <laughs> no. Do we know what that is? Uh, in Ireland, you don't really need to know anymore, don't care to see. That could be anything at all. That could be Shergar. Okay. Go on. Eat your raw milk. Yeah. Chew it. Chew it. Mmm. Yeah. It's lovely. And then take it out and offer it to your pagan gods. So whoever, uh, Bjork and Lunasa and Sinead O'Connor and all the pagan gods. And I'll put it down here. You have to wait for the gods to inspire you. Okay. Okay. All right. Into, into darkness. Cool. I've just seen when you die, Billy. <laughs> um, are you doing anything next week? <laughs> because, because, are you doing anything next week? Yeah, I have a few things lined up. <laughs> no, you're not, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so, do they have any other traditions we know anything about? There's a, a few different rituals described. There was one guy who visited Ireland in the 12th century. He was named uh, Giraldus Cambrensis, or Gerald of Wales. And he talks about how kings used to be inaugurated. And he speaks of one group of kings, the Kenel Connell, who I think come from Donegal. Okay. And as part of the initiation ceremony, the, the would-be king would, um, how do I put this delicately? Uh, he would embrace a white mare as part of the ritual. What do you mean, you mean embrace as in yeah, in, proper? In the biblical sense. As in, in, the, as in yeah. second bar, five bar gate? Yeah. As in, that sort of, yeah. you're making that up. No. Is this true? Well, I'm not doing this, by the way. I've eaten that thing, but I'm not. If you, if somebody leads a white mare around the corner, I am not publicly copulating with a white mare. There's no way you can go straight to a mare. You'd have to like build up to it, surely. Probably a goat before that, and then be like an, an Alsatian. Fluffer, like that, just before you get to the goat. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything written about that? Funnily <laughs> enough, Alsatian fluffers are not mentioned in really? early Ireland. I'd imagine that's probably a bit of the book of Celts that was probably taken out. <laughs> When Patrick arrived in Pagan Ireland, Druids had immense power. And there are still a few hanging around. The Druid was a very powerful person. It had three functions, the bard, the storyteller, the history keeper, the harp player, for example. And the bard had the power to bring down the king through satires if the king was abusing his powers, for example. Tharna de Kocht, Tharna de Fasocht, Tharna de Vanachti. You had the role of the healer the diviner, the seer, the shaman. And then you had the olive, the brehan. I invoke the goddess Bridget as the maiden of springtime. I call on your inspiration. Tar Agus Falcha. Tar Agus Falcha. Druids had authority right through the country, unlike kings. Kings, their power was very much regional. Uh, nobody could harm a druid, so they were there to uh, negotiate. If two kings were battling, they would negotiate with each other. Later writings portray Patrick as some sort of druid slayer, right? And mm -hmm. he goes up against them and he does battle with them. As a modern-day druid, how does that make you feel about him? Well, I don't think he was. I mean, I've read Patrick's writings, um, his Confessio and his Epistula, and he comes across as a very, very humble kind of man, very insecure. And I don't, I mean, in these stories you hear about that he had druidic powers himself and he could match the druids with his own druidic power. 
from his writings, I don't get a sense that that was what he was like at all. So I don't actually have, uh, I suppose, a negative attitude to Patrick from those stories, but I think many pagans might have because of the legacy. So what's the ceremony today involved? What is today, first of all? Well, we're celebrating Imulk, which is honouring the goddess Bridget. And it's interesting that this is a documentary about Patrick when if he came, when he came to Ireland, people would have been honouring the goddess Bridget. She is uh, the triple goddess. She represents the maiden, the mother, and the crone. May this water bring you courage. And it's interesting, because Patrick's emblem, the story is he had the shamrock, to explain the trinity. That would have been very easy for people to understand that, because the notion of a triple deity was already here. Behold the light that I have nurtured. The sun is now returning. So is that Bridget the same as St. Bridget? I think so. Bridget was very, very important in Ireland at the time, and um, she couldn't have been gotten rid of. But remember, Christianity, when Patrick came, it was a very gradual process. He didn't come in and just Christianize the whole country. It wasn't until about the 16th century that paganism was seen as bad and that Christianity was seen as good. So that polarity came into play. But up to then, you could hold both. In Anam and Bradon Fasa, Exnov, Salin Vanaha, Gaumwich Buikas, Sloan, Sloan, Gafol. Somebody like Patrick as a slave probably would have been eating very basic foods, maybe drinking quay and eating curds and porridge, that kind of thing. He's little Miss Muffet at this point. So where was he kept? Would he have been chained up? Was he with other people? Was he on his own? Well, he's working as a herdsman in the summertime. Uh, the herds would have been brought away from the farmstead and brought to upland pastures, pretty isolated. Imagine how bored he was. Times like July, they wouldn't have had meat because the slaughtering wasn't happening until the autumn. Okay. What they used to do was they would uh, use a small blade and they would open the veins of a cow. Yeah. Um, and they would draw some of the blood and then they would boil this. I have some. Oh, why do you blood. always have this stuff? <laughs> so we have some cattle blood here. Oh, no way. Yeah, we'll make it into a cake. Can we spice this up a bit? I don't have an awful lot of blood spice at the moment. OK, but... and how long does that take to make now? Well, we just need to congeal it, essentially. It's still in liquid form, and to drink it like that, you, you know, we're not savages uh, here, you'd, are You'd we? be mad like to drink it. Like, that'd be liquid. ridiculous. Yeah. They used to call July Hungry July. Hungry July? Hungry July, because you would have been coming to the end of your stores from last autumn. Mmm! Mmm! That's disgusting! <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd rather eat the spoon. <laughs> It was slavery, pure and simple. He was dragged away from his home, his family, sent to rural Ireland, had to learn Irish to survive. What else would you call it? It was like, the Gale Talks. <laughs> you didn't have to herd livestock. Have you ever been at a teenage Cayley in Connemara? <laughs> Not only did I need a collie dog, some of those women should have been dipped. <laughs> I danced with a girl from Leash, I got liver fluke. <laughs> On the mountain is where he discovered God. He prayed up to 100 times a day and 100 times a night, normal, obvious prayers like, Dear God, can you fix it for me? <laughs> to get off this mountain. I'm cold and I'm hungry. I do sleep quite well. That's mainly because I've got lots of stuff to count. <laughs> but I'm very lonely. Yesterday, I trapped a badger and pretended it was a tiny nun just so I had someone to talk to. <laughs> I call her Mother Tibisa. <laughs> We don't actually know how he escaped from the original slave owner. Oh, we no, no we idea. don't. We don't. Maybe he had a poster of Rita Hayworth, and the only cop that he was gone when they threw a stone through it and there was a big hole in her head. Is that true? <laughs> uh, I doubt it. Is it true that he tried to get a motorbike and jump over a barbed wire into Switzerland? <laughs> so that's not true either. Okay, might not have been in the book of Armagh, but I'm pretty sure it's one of these books that himself, Pele, and Bobby Moore organised a football match against Ger a German national football team in Paris to escape. I'm pretty sure he was an exception <laughs> centre forward. Is that true? Yes. That's true, is it? 
<laughs> One day on the mountain, he hears a voice, and the voice says, Soon you will go to your own country. Your ship is ready. You might call that a miracle. I would call that a passenger announcement. <laughs> Basically, he just heard, Ladies and gentlemen, my passenger Patrick. Passenger Patrick, first name, Saint. <laughs> Please go to the boarding gate now. Aer Lingus would like to remind all our passengers not to use our logo to demonstrate God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He talks about this arduous journey that he had of 200 miles uh, till he got to a ship. There would have been brigands, there would have been hostile people, maybe out to rob him or, or capture him into slavery again, who knows. But what happens when he gets to the ship? Uh, he asks these sailors to bring him over the sea and initially they refuse. They tell him that they don't want to bring him, but he goes back to his hut and he prays, and then he goes back to them, and eventually they relent. And then the leader of this group, he, um, bizarrely enough, uh, Patrick mentions that he offers St. Patrick his nipples for St. Patrick to suck. What? Yep. Yeah, as a, as a sign of uh, submission. That's how we made friends in this country in those days. The Romans were probably cutting each other open and going, we will mix our blood to be brothers forever. We were all going, Seamus, take off your top. <laughs> Come on, Andy Braswell, let the dog see the rabbit. <laughs> I'm never going to be that close to a man. I've hugged my brothers three times my entire adult life, and all of those times have involved Ray Houghton putting a ball into a net. <laughs> There is actually quite a, a lapse of time between the time when he escaped and when he came back to Ireland. I always had the impression that he stayed 10, maybe 15, maybe more years before he came back to Ireland. My own pet idea is that Patrick was, in fact, an only child and that he simply had to wait until his parents popped off. <laughs> and therefore, he was the sole inheritor. And when he talks, therefore, about, you know, spending money on people, he says to the Irish, you know, I spent the wealth of 15 men or something like that mm. to help you guys and your Christianity. You've given uh, me an image of St. Patrick just popping in to look at his dad going, how are you feeling? <laughs> you OK? You still... How's Matt? Yeah, She's bearing well, up well, yeah, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he seems to have hung in there and when, when the two of them have moved on, presumably by natural causes, he's the sole heir. <laughs> I don't um, think we can go too and, far now here. <laughs> What possesses Patrick to return to Ireland, where he's been abused and mistreated and kept as a slave for six years? So he was mad, actually. Anybody looking <laughs> at it now would think he was out of his head. I think he probably thought he was out of his head, but he couldn't really say no because he had this message, the voice of the Irish, as he called it himself, imploring him to come back. So Patrick escapes and ends up in Britain. And then after a few years, he hears a voice, the voice of the Irish, calling him back in a vision. The voice calling him back, back. Come out to me! <laughs> I don't know what voice he heard. Come out to me, come on back to Ireland, come on, hey! Come on back to Ireland, come on, you don't have to come for that long. Maybe just a short city break or something like that, come on, hey! Come on, maybe stay in the B&B or something like that. All the boys in the gang miss you, say hello, boys. Meh, come on, hey! Come on, and I'm sick of the druids. The clergy have too much power in this country. You should spread Christianity, and that'll probably put an end to that sort of thing. <laughs> Come on back to Ireland, come back to Ireland in its hour of need. The further details are available on www.thegathering.com. The sort of alternative tradition of Patrick, which has him spending anywhere between 10 and 40 years on the continent being educated uh, in Gaul and in Italy. Uh, the place in Gaul that's mentioned is Auxerre. The Bishop of Auxerre is a fellow called Germanus. And we know a lot about Germanus and Auxerre. So from that point of view, uh, you could take it that that kind of thing is plausible, but it's just not true because Patrick himself never mentions that in his writings. But we don't have to bin it because almost certainly it applied to another fellow who's involved in the early Irish mission. That's a man called Palladius. And Palladius is mentioned in continental sources under the year 431. Which is a year before St. Exactly, Patrick. Exactly, a very significant year, yeah. The year before Patrick is supposed to have come to Ireland, this man Palladius, according to continental sources, is sent by no less a person than the Pope, Pope Celestine, who was the Pope at the time. And he is sent as the first bishop, primus episcopus, to the Irish believing in Christ. This is kind of mind-blowing if you've grown <laughs> up in primary school, secondary school in Ireland. Patrick is not the man who introduced Christianity. There were Christians here before him, and there was even a bishop here. So if Palladius got here before Patrick, it begs the question, how come that the streets look like this on March the 17th? And this on July the 6th, Palladius' feast day. Have you ever heard of a man called Palladius? No. no. What would you say if I said Palladius came to Ireland before St. Patrick? No. He's a liar! A big liar! Have you heard of a Palladius? What? Palladius. I'm on your first oh, 
<laughs> it's time for Palladius to be restored to his rightful place in the pantheon of Irish heroes. No longer will he be the forgotten man, the George Lazenby of missionaries, the Jim Court to St. Patrick's Andrea. Who do we want? Palladius! When do we want them? Sometime around the beginning of the century! Who do we want? Palladius! When do we want them? Sometime around the beginning of the century! Onwards! Unfortunately, the historians in Armagh found themselves in a bit of a jam because they didn't want anybody else in Ireland before Patrick. Their solution to the problem is simply to kill off Palladius. Palladius arrives, he doesn't like the weather and he goes home. He doesn't like the Irish and he goes home. So Patrick really is on the next available flight. So that the Patrick we know and celebrate and commemorate on the 17th of March is really a composite St. Patrick. He's, he's made up of traditions belonging to at least two separate people. There does seem to be a constant undercurrent of murmurs about himself, about his personality, about his missionary technique, about the people he's bringing the message to. It's quite striking, although it's not unique to Patrick, that whenever he talks about his success as a missionary, it's more often than not as converting women. Mm. And he refers to one particular individual woman as being strikingly good looking, um, which really doesn't have anything to do with the message, if you think of it. But the fact that he says it implies that he has an eye for the ladies. This is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Oh, spit on me, Patrick! <sighs> Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Yeah. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Oh. I can't go on. Oh. Amen. He must have been massively charismatic if, if women are prepared to leave their jewels on the altar for him. I think anybody who reads Patrick would get the impression he's massively charismatic, period. He's a very, very extraordinary guy. He's just on the right side, I suppose, of lunatic. You know, he's, he's one of these guys that we would regard as, OK, interesting, uh, yeah. very impressive, but not the kind of guy you want to sit beside on the bus. I am finding myself liking real Patrick more and more and more. Unbelievably brave, unbelievably charismatic. What I've lost in kind of my beliefs about this mythical figure has been replaced by newfound respect for the real guy, I suppose. He's the world's most famous patron saint, but who is the real Patrick? I'm on a quest to find out. I'd say a mission, but the big man might get upset. This would have been Patrick the Bishop. Uh, you know, he's back, he's got uh, a few years and he's a few back. bob. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this time it's personal. Yeah, you can see it's very different to Patrick the Slave. Yeah, it's uh, it's much warmer, shall we say, yeah. as I model Bishop Chic. <laughs> what else is different? It's a longer cut as well, obviously. Yeah, it's much longer and you have several layers on of wool and linen. We know when Patrick comes back to Ireland that there are already Christians here. How would he have spread his message, do you think? Well, he deliberately chose areas that were not Christianized already. Wild areas, probably very difficult. But people in Ireland, of course, would have been aware of the Roman Empire and would have been aware of the richness and the prestige that's probably attached to Roman culture. And the Roman religion that was Christianity was probably appealing to people in that respect. So on top of the glamour of Rome, he also had the advantage of speaking the lingo. Yeah, but it's funny, the Welsh language and, and Latin has a P sound in it, P, like his name, Patrick. Yeah. Um, but the native Irish couldn't pronounce P uh, properly, we don't think. They had a K sound where the Welsh had a P sound. So uh, for him in Ireland, his, prob his name probably would have been rendered as something like Cuthric. Uh, uh, so even the most simple thing about St. Patrick isn't as we thought. Yeah. We would not have called him Patrick. We would have called Cuthric. him Cuthric, yeah. In his writings, Patrick does seem to be defensive. What sort of accusations did he face? 
Well, yeah, it, there's a very defensive tone to parts of the Confessio and it seems he was accused of financial impropriety. Newly converted women in particular were placing their jewels um, on the altar as offerings for two reasons that might have been frowned upon. Number one, it was pagan practice, but number two, Patrick would have been seen to be profiting from his uh, converting of Christianity and he flatly denies this. How difficult would it have been for Patrick to traverse Ireland at that time? The way they were travelling was probably on foot possibly on horseback, and maybe even somebody high status like Patrick could even have access to a chariot. We should explain where we are. We are on Croke Patrick, the site that's most associated with St. Patrick. Is this yeah. originally a pagan site, though? Um, well, there's, it's the site at the end of uh, July every year, as you know, the, the pilgrims process up the mountain. We think that it might have been a site of pre-Christian pilgrimage on the Festival of Lunasa, the, the 1st of August, in and around, and that's why it's still celebrated on the last Sunday in July. And people walk up it in their bare feet like, like one of us they do. is doing now. <laughs> One of the most authentic people, rather than you with your lovely shiny boots. Well, you're the devout Christian that's, here now. That's so. right, I am the bishop. Yeah. And are a lot of the sites associated with Patrick originally pagan? Well, places like Tara, they, they wrote him very much into the mythology of Tara. They have very ancient pedigrees going back to the pre-Christian period. And it was a way of carrying forward the ancient tradition in this new sort of Christian context. The only item of clothing that Patrick ever mentioned in the Confessio was his shoes, so... You haven't we'll, had shoes. We'll give you a pair of 50 shoes. Why didn't you give me the bloody shoes down at the bottom of the hill? The penance is good for you, you know. I you can't know. believe you. <laughs> <laughs> that is not, not, that's not funny. Why did he fell in my hall down there? <laughs> and you had shoes in your bag. <laughs> so is this where Patrick banished the snakes from? Well, it's funny you should mention that, actually. Don't have a Because, uh... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> is that a real snake? It's <laughs> a real snake. Oh, here, OK, hold on. Yeah, try him on for size. Right. He'll warm you up. Oh, I don't like snakes. <laughs> when I was making this documentary, I had one rule, no snakes. So imagine my surprise as I was walking up Croke Patrick towards the chapel at the summit, when Billy stopped, took off his backpack, took a snake out of the backpack and draped it around my shoulders. <laughs> Where is his head? Can you not feel it there? Oh, uh, yeah. Where is his head? And I could hear It wasn't a snake, I pissed myself. <laughs> What's his name? That's Diesel, the python. He's a, he's a python? Yeah. So at some point he... Yeah. I couldn't look at Billy, I couldn't look at the snake. I looked over there and then suddenly I could just feel his tongue <laughs> flick my ear. And all I could think was, Jesus Christ! I hope that was Billy. <laughs> I really don't want to turn around and see a snake's head just there. Like some sort of evil Siamese twin. I want to turn around and see Billy in the nip, <laughs> having risked it all on a fairly risky, romantic, homosexual proposition. At that point, I'd be like, thank God for that. Kiss me quick, we can confess in the chapel. Let's make Croke Patrick into Brokeback Mountain. You're a deeply sadistic man, aren't you? <laughs> Neil, you should suffer for your art. We know that snakes didn't make it to Ireland after the Ice Age. Ireland got cut off from Britain um, before they had a chance to make it over. You do realise you could have said absolutely anything there. You could have said he invented speedboats or bales of baguettes, and all I can think of is I've got a snake on my neck. <laughs> So what do you think the driving force behind Patrick's mission to Ireland was? Whatever happened to Patrick when he returned to Britain after being a captive in Ireland, he became utterly convinced that the end of the world was very close. And he believed that the only thing that was preventing the return of Jesus was that there were some places out on the frontiers that hadn't, even beyond the frontiers of the empire, that hadn't heard of Jesus Christ. And he thinks that if he announces the gospel there, he is, he is as it were, the herald of the end. That's them all done, my lord! You may begin the day of judgment! The very edge of the world, my lord! Nothing more to be done! I'm 
pretty sure that's everything. I've been very thorough. Patrick will be shocked that we're here. Yeah, well, of right? course, is that, yeah. He would have been surprised that his theology was so wrong. Could you have left someone out? Nah, I would have spotted another pagan. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm 100%. There are no more pagans. How could you be sure on the last one? You must have forgotten someone. Nah. But, not Tony. The Christian community in Ireland see Patrick as a loose cannon. He's a maverick. Uh, he's an oddball. The confessio is his complaint to these people. It's a bit like a letter to the paper saying, you know, who are you to be giving out about me? My, you know, I'm doing something completely different. The end is coming. My authority is coming straight from God. To whom we may concern, yours is etc. Patrick. Patrick, exactly. So if Patrick is so wildly off message, then why is he the poster boy for Christianity? To understand that, you have to think of Ireland in the late seventh century. It's a, an island full of petty kingdoms and families warring with one another. Muraku and a few other churchmen come up with a vision of one island, one nation, then there's one people, one family, then they shouldn't be fighting. And if you're going to have a baptised nation, you need someone to baptise it. For Muraku, Patrick is an ideal person, long ago, not linked with anyone, not known too much, not associated with any one church. He will baptise the nation. The person who baptises them is their apostle. The apostles are those who will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. If Patrick is the apostle of the Irish, Patrick gets to judge the Irish at the end. Myths suggest that um, Patrick is going to judge the Irish at the end of time, which is going to be brilliant. There'll be seven billion people lined up to be judged by God, and about five or six million of us lined up to be judged by Patrick. It'd be like having priority voting. <laughs> Just walking by the Chinese going, <laughs> that really didn't work out with that one child policy, did it? There'd be four big red leather chairs for the judges. Say Patrick, say Bridget, Column Kill, and then Brezzy. <laughs> Patrick will be reading CVs. What's the name? Bertie Hearn. Whoa! I should send you to purgatory, but I've sent Jackie Healy Ray there 20 minutes ago and he's already gotten it rezoned. <laughs> South Killarney West and has a leisure centre. <laughs> Come back to me. What's the name? Mool. Martin McGuinness. Whoa! There's a lot of stuff here. Let's just go through the bullet points. Probably shouldn't have used that phrase. <laughs> It's a game of two halves, I'll be honest. The 70s and the 80s, not looking great. Uh, 90s and 90s, you did a lot. Uh, the thing is, thing is, Martin, I'm only judging Irish people, and technically speaking. <laughs> you should have seen your face, Martin. I'm only messing. Go on out of that. You thought I was going to put you in the other queue over there with Rory McElroy. <laughs> He's very intense, like he's really driven. He strikes me as the kind of Roy Keane of his day. I'd imagine that he would convert a pagan and not really kind of enjoy it. He wouldn't live in the moment. He would go, I have to convert the next pagan and the next pagan and the next pagan. So Patrick dies sometime between 463 AD and 493 AD, and this is where he's allegedly buried, yes? This is the traditional burial place of St. Patrick, the hill here in Down Patrick. So how do we know he's actually buried here? Well, the Book of Armagh, which was written a couple of hundred years after Patrick's death, relates that he didn't die in Armagh, which is, of course, where they would want him to have been buried. Patrick was buried here, and they had to find an excuse According to the Book of Armagh, his body was put on the back of an oxen cart and they seem to have been wayward cows because obviously they should have gone somewhere in Armagh but they took a wrong turn somewhere near Newry and they apparently came here instead of going to Armagh. Well, those roundabouts are very confusing as well. Well, they can be very confusing, yeah. particularly yeah. if you're a cattle, like <laughs> I know. Now, the gravestone was put here about 100 years ago because people used to come and take a scoop of earth from St Patrick's grave for luck. Right. Um, Bram Stoker... Uh, he comes from Clontarf, but he married a lady from Newcastle, which is just down the road, and he heard of this tradition, and he incorporated it into uh, the Dracula story so that Dracula has to travel with his own soil. From what you've read and all your research and all the connections you have to him, what do you think of the man himself? Do you hear historical guy, not the Superman? 
I think it's worth celebrating the real St. Patrick because he is a, a very interesting individual. He's been a slave. There's this piracy involved in his stories. He's truculent. He's very willful. He goes AWOL on the church. He comes here and decides he's going to create his own church. So, yeah, I think... He's Sinead O'Connor, isn't he? he he's, he's very willful. <laughs> <laughs> <That's the word. laughs> he was the poster pin-up boy of the early... Christian movement. He was like the Donny Osmond of the early Christian movement. You're showing your age there. Let's say, <laughs> let's say Justin Bieber, shall we? Justin Bieber, OK. So what happens around these parts on March the 17th to celebrate St. Patrick? As a community, we come out and jointly lay a wreath here on St. Patrick's uh, grave. And the parade itself, it's a small parade compared to Dublin, but we have it as a cross-community festival. And really, if you think of it, what better role model for this part of Ireland than someone from Britain who became the patron saint of Ireland. You can't get any more cross-community than that. So how do you get from Patrick the Man to the modern-day parades? The first parades are really American-based. Uh, you see in the 18th century, around 1730, 1737 is a big day. In Boston, there's a tradition where it's Irish guys who are serving with the British Army. And they want to go for a few beers, it's a national day. So they go and parade outside their commander's house, make a raucous noise up and down with the band. Eventually the commander comes out, throws them a few pounds, they're off down the pub. You can see how that would catch on. If you give them money the first time you walk by and you can go and then get boozed up, you go, oh, yeah, it's this is going to be a yeah. thing that you're going to do every year then. Once the British leave in the middle of the 18th century, you then see the Irish diaspora taking control of it. It'll be from a pub to the church, from mass, or on the way back from church. I like the way they decided to have a parade on the routes that they were going to and from anyway. Oh, we're going gonna... to the pub, we're going to mass, we might as well make a big song and dance about it. Everything goes green for St. Patrick's Day. Landmarks are lit up green, rivers are dyed green, in border counties even they're diesel. <laughs> And was green always the colour of St. Patrick? Was it always important? No, St. Patrick's colour is actually blue. Patrick's Day used to be a different colour. Green wasn't actually the colour. Was... No, I'm pretty sure that's Pepsi and no, Santa Claus. <laughs> Parading tradition is very kind of new in some way to Ireland. In the middle of the 19th century, just after the famine, you see, bizarrely, it's actually the temperance movement who are the first people who begin parading. Um, and that again, would seem like a bit of a... It's a contradiction in terms. Yeah. From the 1920s, it's a military parade. It's a Free State Army up and down O'Connell Street. Um, after the Second World War, uh, the industrial parade. So you've all those images of the Guinness trucks, those kind of things, it's Irish industry being put on the street. In some ways, it's changed dramatically in the late 20th century when it became much more a marketing ploy for Fulcher Island, for Guinness. It's about sort of selling Ireland as a brand. We've got the snakes, we've got the shamrock, we've got the green, we've got all that paddy whacker, if you like. But what we haven't got is any kind of sense of a 5th century character who brought Christianity to the Irish state. When I started this search, this pursuit of Patrick, I thought I knew exactly what I'd find. How wrong I was. The real Patrick, I think we should celebrate because nobody knows him, really. The Patrick who's talked about on March 17 is an entirely different person. In fact, he's not a person at all. He's a figment of the imagination. He's a folk hero. He's a, he's a national hero in lots of ways. Patrick is our first real voice from Ireland, so he's moving us really from, from prehistory into history. When you read his writings, you actually get into the psychology and mindset of a 5th century Christian, which is absolutely amazing. I think that he's relevant, that's the most important thing. I think he's relevant, he's not just a historical figure. Patrick comes before there's a division in the church between Catholic and Protestant. No matter where you come from, Patrick is somebody that we can all claim, that we can all own as our own, as our patron. If we've learned anything from this programme, is that every generation, if it's 200 years after he died, if it's the 1800s in America, Patrick belongs to all of us, and what we do is we use whatever version of Patrick we need for the time. Can you kick the snake off me now? Okay, I suppose.